Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. I, as always, am your host, Simon. I'm still one of my writers, in this case, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin, who's written me a script. Nostradamus, did he actually predict anything? I mean, I feel like anyone who watches this show or listens to this show regularly will know that my, you probably think my media will be like, no, absolutely not. What nonsense. And it's like, yeah, of course not. Of course it's nonsense. But also, I feel like Nostradamus probably predicted a lot. And it's like, you know, the more you predict, the more likely you are for something to be right. Like, if I just sat down and came up with, like, a thousand predictions for the future today, some of them are going to come true. And then in ten years, people can't look back and just cherry-pick the ones that I got right, which I feel is exactly what happens with Nostradamus. But, look, obviously, precognition and telling the future is obviously nonsense. So thanks for watching. Well, that was quick. No, let's go. Thanks, Kevin. I've heard a lot about many predictions of Nostradamus throughout my life. He wrote thousands of prophecies where, which people continue to pore over. And one of my grandfathers was even a big believer of Nostradamus. Because of all this, I, like most people, believe that Nostradamus spent his entire life working as a charlatan. <laughs> Respect, Grandad. But he was never portrayed as some sort of starving artist, like many others often are, so I always assumed that he was born independently wealthy and just frittered his life away as a seer. It turns out that I could not have been more wrong, and I was shocked to discover that while researching Nostradamus that he had a regular 9-to-5 job which he was quite good at, and it wasn't until his retirement that he began spouting nonsense. Oh, I just assumed that he was spouting the nonsense. Like, I did appear that I did think that he was like independently wealthy. I just assumed that he'd be like, yeah, 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 it's my latest Nostro book. And it's like, what's this? Predictions for like 2160? Yeah, the world's going to end. Buy it. It's like seven shillings or whatever. Based on the posts your crazy relatives are always making on Facebook, this actually seems like a pretty normal life trajectory. I suppose I also shouldn't call Nostradamus' prophecies nonsense yet, since we haven't examined whether or not he successfully predicted anything. Though if you're holding out hope that a closer look at his work will reveal that Nostradamus really was a genuine psychic, then I welcome you to your first video on this channel. Yeah, exactly. That's what I say. Everyone knows. It's like, this channel's called Decoding the Unknown. It's like, Nostradamus' predictions, and then immediately the Zos sarcastic British man telling you that it's all rubbish. I, said, I like that people watch this channel because I love like shit all over this stuff, but it does surprise me because it it does seem like the channel doesn't deliver what you might expect. It should just be called like skeptical head. Regardless, Nostradamus is still a surprisingly interesting historical figure. People who came claim to possess otherworldly powers are a dime a dozen, and it's extremely rare for any of them to become famous during their lifetimes. It's even more rare for someone to become famous for their success in these endeavors, rather than just as a well-publicized liar. If you think about any famous modern-day medium or psychic, they are almost always reviled and regarded as con men who prey on the desperate and stupid. I won't name any names, since they've managed to avoid conviction despite perpetrating obvious frauds, but you know exactly the type of person I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, in my opinion, the famous dude who bends spoons might be one of these, just that's my opinion, and I'm not referring to any particular famous spoon-bending litigious dude right now, no one in particular at all. Definitely not. <coughs> Conversely, by the time Nostradamus had died, he was personally employed by the Queen of France. Even if people were more superstitious back in the 1500s, that's still a remarkable level of success. There has to be some sort of justification for Nostradamus' prestige and notoriety as a seer. So let's examine the life of Michel de Notre Dame, one of the world's most famous plague doctors. Oh, sh**. Okay, so that was his day job. I was like, as soon as Kevin said like, he was employed by the Queen of France, I'm like, yeah, not as like Nostradamus, the dude who predicts the future. It's going to be like Nostradamus, whatever his nine to five day job was that he was apparently good at. And being like the Queen's doctor or whatever. You're like, that means you're a good doctor, right? Today's video is brought to you by the legends over at Ridge who are making a fantastic gift this year. This could be a great gift for someone that you really like, really beautiful gifts, or maybe just for yourself, maybe you're like, I deserve it. I've worked hard this year. I deserve a Ridge wallet. I want to get rid of my old bulky, stupid wallet and get myself a beautiful Ridge. If you don't know what Ridge are, they've been redefining everyday essentials with style and practicality, and this time they're turning up the heat with their new collection. Look, I've had this one for ages. This is my burnt titanium one, which holds up to 12 cards, although I just have three in there. Plus a little money clip on the back. I just love how this one looks. I just think it's really cool. But if you're a bit more bold, if you're a bit like, I like a bit of color in my life, fact boy, well, check this out. This is the new Hyper Lime and Ceramic Powder Collection from Ridge. They're a burst of color inspired by high performance gear, perfect for those who crave both style and utility. And that's not all. The Ceramic Powder Collection offers pastel shades with a smooth, soft finish. It's really nice. It's really beautiful looking and it's scratch resistant. 
feels really good in the hands. They got 30 plus colors and styles, including classic leather, which I have right here. I might switch to this one. This is particularly beautiful. It's like just this wonderful leather material. It even smells good. Plus, they offer AirTag attachments on all relevant products, so you'll never lose your gear again. Ridge Wallet expands to hold 12 cards, as I said. So say goodbye to your bulkier wallet, plus RFID blocking, so no digital pickpockets getting at your stuff. Then there's a Ridge key case, which this is mine here, the carbon fiber one. They've also got it in lime to match with uh, this wallet. Maybe I'll switch these out. It's very easy to do that, by the way. You just uh, pop the keys in and uh, you're good to go. Easy. Plus, if you buy these together, you'll get 30% off, which is fantastic. They offer also offer a 99-day risk-free trial so you can give the perfect present worry-free. And here's a great deal. Go to ridge.com slash unknown and get up to 30% off through December the 20th. And by using my link, ridge.com slash unknown, you can enter your email for a free chance to win a Ridge bundle worth $4,000. No purchase needed. Thanks to Ridge for sponsoring. And now back to it. Early life. There are a lot of apocryphal tales about Nostradamus' life which make it difficult to sort the facts from the fiction, but I'll try my best to stick with the things that are verifiable rather than just rumors and legends. It all began in the 1400s with Nostradamus' grandfather, Guy Gassonet. These guys are all French, I assume. Not like this guy, but I mean like these dudes. They're all French, and I'm just guessing at their pronunciations, but I always do, like, it's spelled Gassonet, and I'm always just like, I don't know, throw, like, a bit of a French accent on there. Imagine that you're saying, like, ah, saucy saw, and just, uh, just throw that on a name and take off the last consonant. Guy Gassonet! Sounds vaguely racist, doesn't it? It's okay with the French, right? Because they, like, they rib the British, we rib the French. It's all in good fun. Now, I'm sure there's French people listening to this being like, Oh, Simon, you roast beef. <laughs> Guy was from a Jewish family and is reported as be having been from a long line of rabbinical scholars. Various accounts report him as either being a grain dealer, a money lender, or a physician, and a Kabbalist, a type of Jewish mystic. It's often said that Nostradamus was educated by both of his grandfathers, but this is almost certainly false. Guy appears to have been born in 1430, which would have made him 73 by the time Nostradamus was even born. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, I have such an incredibly small brain. I don't know how this thought entered my brain, but I'm like, wait, grandfather? We didn't he have four grandfathers? And then I'm thinking, how many grandfathers do you have, Simon? Hold on, I've got a package. Oh God, I'll be right back. Special delivery. Sorry, I'm back every day. It's the FedEx man. I was quite excited about this one. I'm not sure who this video is sponsored by, but I just got a new pair of Vessies in the mail, which are a regular sponsor. Pretty excited about that. As soon as this is done, I'm going to go try those on. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, my granddads. I'm not sure why I thought for a moment that I had four granddads. I I mean, I, I'm in a step family, so it's a little bit more confusing. It's because I had like three granddads, although two of them were dead before I was even born, which perhaps even adds to the confusion. But look, why are we talking about this? No reason. Let's carry on. Guy appears to have been born in 1430, which would have made him 73 by the time Nostradamus was even born. Okay, so it'd be like 93 when he was being educated or whatever. Although it was the past, so people would get educated younger. But then people also lived for a much shorter time, right? 1430s? He was 73, but still alive. <laughs> <laughs> the past. But what he definitely did get from his grandfather was his famous name. Obviously not Gassonet, but de notre Dame. You see, Guy had been born into a Jewish family and the plague wasn't the only dangerous threat for Europe during this time. There was also this nasty thing you might have heard of called the Inquisition. So in 1455, Guy decided to convert to Catholicism to avoid persecution. Whether he actually converted or just got baptized for show is a matter of debate, but his new Christian life meant that he needed a new Christian name. I mean, if someone was like, yeah, yeah, we're persecuted, your religion, fact boy. I don't have any religion, but they'd be like, they'd be like so uh, you need to be like Pastafari or whatever. It's like, yes, all hail the pasta monster. That's me. Love him. Carry on. Where do I have to go? <laughs> it's definitely not for show. Love that. Yeah, love that. And there was no possible name that he could have chosen better that says, I'm a Catholic living in France better than Pierre de Notre Dame. Pierre had a son named Jao. <laughs> Sorry, French people. Jaume, maybe. Who grew up to be a notary and had a son named Michel with his wife, Renier de Saint-Rémy. The couple also had at least eight other children, but they're not important. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those seven children. That's that's the historical footnote that you have. Nostradamus' brother, we don't know your name, we don't care. You're like, they're seven children, not important. That's it. That's the historical reference for your entire life, seven people. And honestly, listener, that's probably going to be your place in history. Probably even less because you don't have a super famous brother. Or maybe you do. <laughs> God, it's depressing, isn't it? We're all going to be forgotten. I mean, it's not really depressing. It's kind of nice in a way. It's kind of freeing, no matter what you do. 
<laughs> That's depressing. Oh, God. It's like, yeah, eventually Hitler will be forgotten. And you're like, oh. And he was a right knob. Michel was born December of 1503, though the exact day is not known. It was clear early on that Michel was a bright child and he studied maths, astronomy, and astrology. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that way there was like, yeah, what are you studying today? Well, we're doing mathematics. We're going to be looking at the planets and then we're going to learn about Taurus. <laughs> okay. In addition to learning to read Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Again, it is said that both of his grandfathers tutored him, but this does seem unlikely. His paternal grandfather was 73 when he was born and his maternal grandfather disappeared from the historical record when he was only one years old. That doesn't mean it's impossible, just that it's really unlikely. The only reason the question of who was educating Michel matters is because it is believed he was taught about Kabbalah and mysticism from his grandparents. If it was just about who taught him maths and science, no one would really care. When Michel was 14 years old, he began attending the University of Avignon to earn his bachelor's degree. Unfortunately, he was kicked out after less than a year. It was nothing personal. There had just been an outbreak of the plague, so the school kicked everyone out and shuttered their doors for a while. There's no indication what he did for the next four years, but when Michel was 18, he began traveling traveling the countryside to research herbal remedies. This continued for eight years, with Michel re researching and working as an apothecary. Just so there's no confusion, an apothecary is just the old-timey word for a pharmacist or a chemist, and lots of actual medicine does include plants. Yeah, like my family. That was like the family business for a long time. Apothecaryism, or whatever it's called. Well, I don't know much about it, because my family don't really talk much about that stuff, but I do know that they were apothecaries, and they had, like, apothecary shops, and would, like, deal people herbs and <laughs> Alleged drug dealers with rights. By any estimation, Michelle is still largely dealing with science at this point, though astrology was also a part of medical science back then because it was believed that the celestial bodies had an influence on the body's humors. They don't, and the body's humors weren't even real. And that is why I'm glad I was not born before germ theory or antibiotics. Yeah, can you imagine? Born between germ theory and antibiotics, it's like, yeah, yeah, we know there are these tiny things killing you, but we can't do about it. Ah, oh, rubbish. Before it was just like, oh, what's killing you, spirits? Can you do anything that? We can pray. Uh, brilliant. <laughs> Carry on with the prayers. And then germ theory comes around. You're like, oh no, the suicide of the spirits weren't doing anything. <laughs> Anyway, in 1529, at the age of 26, Michel enrolled at the University of Montpellier to earn his doctorate in medicine. Unfortunately, he was again kicked out of school, and this time it was personal. The school had a strict policy against doctoral students having performed a manual trade. That's very snobby, isn't it? Which would have disqualified Michel because of his work as an apothecary. He was also allegedly talking about the doctors there, which wasn't going over so well. That's fascinating. The past is fascinating. That's also like my family. that They went from apothecaries to doctors, like when doctoring became a thing. And uh, I didn't. I think, to my, I think my grandma, she's dead now, was a little bit, a little bit disappointed. <laughs> I wasn't a good enough student to go to medical school anyway. So it wasn't, it was like, it was ever an option, Nan. Um, but I think she was probably a little bit disappointed that I didn't become a doctor. I'm not sure, but probably, <laughs> of course. But my dad was also like, don't do it. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, it's really hard work. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Well noted. Why do that? Of course, this is also debated a bit as well, with many sources claiming that Michel did in fact graduate from Montpellier, but allegedly the original expulsion document still exists in the school's faculty library. I can't find an image of it, and I don't think Simon is going to pay me to fly to France to go look over it myself. You're goddamn right, Kevin. But it would be very bold claim to make if it were not the case, so I'm inclined to believe it. And if anyone watching or listening to this happens to live in France and wants to go to the Montpellier faculty library, please feel free to check out Register S2 Folio 87 and let me know in the comments if the expulsion slip is really there. If someone actually does this, you f***ing legend. <laughs> the good doc There's a lot of people who listen to this show. It's entirely possible that someone is listening in Montpellier, in which case, bonjour, Pierre. The good doctor. After leaving school, Michel went back to traveling as an apothecary and a plague doctor. He quickly gained a reputation due to the success of the rather unusual methods he employed to combat outbreaks of the plague. For example, he advised citizens to remove the dead, diseased corpses from the streets, to practice basic hygiene on a regular basis, to only drink water that was known to be clean, and to get some fresh air once in a while. Pfft, Nostradamus, what are you talking about? Pierre de Nostradamus, whatever the f name was. Michel de Nostradamus. It's like, uh, obviously, none of that's all bullshit. You just gotta pray harder, Michelle. Come on. He also explicitly forbid the practice of bloodletting on his back. What nonsense! That's how you let the spirits out! Even though this was the standard method for treating the plague, it was the standard method for treating pretty much anything, and Michelle's strong stance against it made him a bit of a renegade. Even though all of this stuff is obvious to us now, and it's shocking that they wouldn't have figured it out by the 1500s, all of these practices really were seen as strange back then. It's like, what are you doing drinking that clean water, you idiot? Just pray harder and bleed everywhere. 
What the fuck? They understood ideas like social distancing and quarantining to combat an outbreak, but that wouldn't be enough by itself, as everybody had horrible hygiene and left dead bodies around all willy-nilly. Oh my god, I'm so glad I don't live in the past. Just in general, like, everything was worse. And it's like, for me, I'm like a white British dude. The past was not, I mean, it was, and it, it, for me, it would have been like not the worst ever, but it would still be shit. And can you imagine being a woman? <laughs> like, oh my God, the past, even the recent past. <laughs> it's like, holy shit. Like when it's like, when did women get the right to vote? It's like sometime in the 20th century. <laughs> and I know it sounds like, it's like, yeah, Simon, of course the past was different, but it's not that long. The older I get, the older I get, the more I realize that it wasn't that long ago. Because when you're like 12 or whatever, you're like, 100 years sounds like forever. And now I'm like in my 30s. I'm like, 100 years is only a third, three times the amount of time I've lived ago. And you're like, it doesn't seem that long. <laughs> At this point, it's also important to note how difficult it was to gain a positive reputation as a plague doctor. Michel was expelled from Montpellier without earning his medical degree, but plague doctors were volunteers who didn't actually need to be licensed physicians. In fact, most of them probably weren't, since those that were actual doctors were either terrible at their job or young doctors that were just starting out. When a plague doctor rolled into town, dressed from the head to the toe in the iconic and somewhat terrifying costume for which they're famous, not somewhat terrifying, Kevin, just terrifying, it was the last thing people wanted to see. Plague doctors were seen as harbingers of death. Their job wasn't really to cure people, it was just to count how many people were dead and infected. They would be contracted by towns who were facing infection, with those contracts forbidding them from seeing non-plague patients and forcing them to essentially live in quarantine at all times, except when visiting a sick patient. The fact that these plague doctors didn't all die off immediately was really an accident more than anything else. The iconic costume provided a lot of protection from the disease, as they wore gloves, boots, long cloaks, and a mask that made it impossible to get too close to a patient. But these masks weren't actually designed to do that yeah with the, the weird like long beaky mask thing that was just i, I know this and i'm about to I'm, i don't know why i'm saying this because kevin's about to mention it. i'm just probably saying it to show what a big brain i am but they stuffed it full of herbs and shit because they were like oh yeah miasma theory the smells make people sick so if we just stuff it with lavender everything will be fine and obviously that has nothing to do with it but having the uh the big beak thing just meant they weren't like basically getting right up in people's faces and getting their diseases. So that's nice. But these masks weren't actually designed for that. They were designed to store lovely smelling herbs and spices that would counteract the bad smells that caused disease, because that's how doctors thought the world worked. With all these doctors that only showed up when people were dying and had little to offer beyond bloodletting services that would make things worse, it's not shocking that people would have a poor opinion of them. It's also not shocking that Michelle's recommendations of effective preventative measures would have helped him quickly gain a solid reputation. But what made him most famous as a plague doctor were his rose pills. Not only were Michelle's recommendations on hygiene and drinking clean water able to help prevent outbreaks from spreading, but when combined with his rose pill, he was reported to have a very high rate of success in actually curing sick patients. Of course, this was again done by accident. The rose pills contained a variety of herbs and spices that were pulverized along with rose petals, then sprinkled with rose juice. <laughs> I didn't know you could juice a rose. <laughs> So they could be formed into lozenges. Patients were instructed to keep these lozenges under their tongues and let them dissolve, as they were designed a very strong, sweet odor that would ward away the evil sense of disease. What could this possibly be doing? Surely this is just like a placebo effect. Of course, we now understand that that's not how science or medicine work. These pills were successful because they were essentially just a large dose of vitamin C, an important vitamin for the function of your immune system. Which doesn't mean that if you take lots of it, you're not going to get a cold. Which was the crazy scientist who was banging on about this forever, even though it's been like massively disproven. I remember my mother-in-law once for like one Christmas or whatever. It was a weird gift. She bought me and my wife just a big bag of like pure vitamin C. And I looked at it, it's like, you know, like half a kilo of vitamin C or whatever. And I'm like, looked it up on Google. And I'm like, you're supposed to have like less than a thimbleful or like a pin pin like head of a pin amount per day and it's like yeah but a lot, drinking lots of vitamin c means you never get sick and i'm like that's not real but my mother-in-law also believes in like crystal healing and stuff <laughs> so uh to say we have a difference of opinion on that sort of thing would be putting it rather mildly <laughs> she once bought a, a, a dog got like um uh what the f word for ball cancer testicular cancer got ball cancer and he didn't have an operation scheduled for like a few weeks or whatever and in the meantime she went onto the internet and bought some really expensive like cancer cds and you might be thinking what's a cancer cd and because I, <laughs> I realize that's not a great way of describing it it's basically some person online selling for uh, i'm sure what was a ton of money 
uh, CDs which contain music which cures cancer. And, uh, and, and that's not real. And it's a scam. And my mother-in-law wastes a lot of money on this stuff. <laughs> It's like, what are you doing? Stop. Please stop buying crystals. In 1531, he was invited by Jules César Scalier, a leading scholar and physician, to come to Asian France to work. Once there, he married a woman with whom he had a son and daughter, though sadly her name has been lost to time. Eventually, everything was going great. We are continuing to travel and work as a doctor, curing people with his combination of vitamin C and common sense. But back then, it wasn't so common, was it? But then in 1534, tragedy struck. While the Great Plague Doctor was out traveling to treat patients back home, his family had died of the plague. Oh, the past is horrible. It's like, no, you're like, oh no, his wife dies or something. It's like, no, his whole family die of the thing he's out there treating. Take note, Alanis Morissette, because that is actual irony. Unfortunately, this severely damaged Michelle's reputation. How could anybody trust a doctor that couldn't even save his own family? Sure, he was probably a hundred miles away at the time, but that's hardly an excuse. A few years later, Michelle found himself accused of heresy by the Church of Asia due to some offhand remark he made about a religious statue. He was ordered to go to Toulouse to appear before the Inquisition. Not particularly wanting to walk into his own execution, he instead fled to Italy, where he continued to study and practice medicine. He remained there for about six six years until his travels brought him back to France. <laughs> Hopefully the Inquisition's chilled out a bit by then. When he returns in 1545, Michel aided the prominent physician Louis Serre in combating a major outbreak of the plague in Marseille. He then continued onward, tackling a couple more major outbreaks on his own. One of these was in O One of these was in En 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 Provence, the capital of the Provence region. A popular story is that he was so successful in fighting the plague there that he was given a pension for life as thanks afterwards, though that's probably not the case. Allegedly, Michel received multiple pensions for life thanks to his work as a plague doctor, though there doesn't appear to be any evidence to support this. There are surviving documents detailing the negotiations and final contracts between towns and other plague doctors, and these doctors were not well paid for their services. Negotiations usually consisted of trying to secure a doctor while offering them as little money as possible, with some contracts even being amended after they'd been signed in order to cut the salary and benefits of the doctors. Yeah, that's a, when you're always bidding for the the when you're the person who's bidding for a contract and it's just going to be awarded to the cheapest person i don't know that's a kind of sucky business to be in granted most plague doctors were pretty sh whereas Michelle was accidentally very competent, so it's possible he was receiving much better pay and benefits. Personally, I could go either way on that one, but I do find it unlikely that he would receive such exceptional contracts without any evidence of them surviving. It ultimately isn't that important because he had a much better way to secure his financial future. You see, the plague wasn't all bad news. Salon de Provence was the site of one of the other major outbreaks that Michel had combated on his own after returning to France, so it seemed like the perfect place to settle down. This is the thing, like, while the plague like killed like half the people or something ridiculous like that, it also meant that there was a ton like <laughs> less more resources for everyone who survived, <laughs> which is super dark. But it's ah oh, yeah, that whole family were died, and then their farm came on the market, and it was real cheap because loads of farms were coming on the market. So the survivors were like, yes, <laughs> cheap property, the rental. All we need now to solve like the housing crisis is for loads of people to die. It feels like a James Bond villain's plan, doesn't it? It's like, how are we going to solve this problem? It's for the good of humanity. We must kill half of humanity. It was there in 1547 they met a wealthy 21-year-old widow named Anna Ponzard. Michel got a good reputation, a new rich wife, and at the advanced age of 43, he was ready to retire from the grind and get down to some lovemaking. He and Anna had three sons and three daughters, and Michel had nothing but time. He could have used that to raise his children and be a good father, but instead he decided to dive headfirst into the occult. And he definitely did it because he was a magical psychic, not because he was in it for the money. I feel like I've been saying that sarcastically, but isn't he rich now? He just married a rich 21-year-old. It's like, he's he's done well. He's like, I'm sorted. Like <laughs> The Rise of Nostradamus Michel's literary career began in 1550 with the publication of his first almanac. It was a common practice for authors to Latinize their names, especially those engaging in intellectual pursuits rather than fiction. Latin was also the language both of scholars and of the church, and using a Latinized version of one's name would immediately give them more credibility as a man of intellect. And so it was that with the publication of his first almanac, the Michel de Notre Dame became Nostradamus. Almanacs were very popular at the time for a few reasons. From a practical standpoint, they were closer to pamphlets than books, which made them much cheaper and easier to produce. This meant that you could reach a wider audience who might then be inclined to purchase your future works. However, magazines are really expensive these days. I haven't bought a magazine in forever because I subscribe to this um, 
Either I subscribe to the magazine, which makes it like super cheap or free. I am not free, but like, you know, it's online, so you don't get a paper copy. Or I use an app called Readly. And this is not a sponsorship, but it's incredible. It's just like an app you pay. I can't even remember how much. It's really cheap. It's like a few pounds or like it's less than 10 bucks a month or something. And you get all of these magazines. It's crazy how many magazines you get every month just in this app. And I read it on my iPad. And I'm like, this is, I mean, all the free time I have to read magazines. But like I do read some and I'm like, it's amazing. But I would say, sorry, my whole point was that magazines, like you go into the shops now, it'd be like, I swear it's like six, seven, eight pounds for a magazine. I'm like, how much is a book? 12, 13 pounds for like a paperback? Am I out of touch with that? That seems about right. And it's like, when did books become the same price as magazines? This meant that you could reach a wider audience who might then be inclined to purchase your future works. They were a really good way to dis disseminate important and useful information, the sort of things that we take for granted today. If you want to know when the next full moon is, you can just look over at the calendar that your bank gave you for free last January. Kevin, what year are you living in? Your bank sent you a calendar? <laughs> what? This is the sort of shit that I'd see in my uh, as, as a child. Like I'd be in my nan's house and they'd be like, "Nan, what's it? Why have you got a calendar from Nat West on the on the wall?" She'd be like, "Well, they gave it to me for free." And I'm like, "It's just advertising. It's just like talking about Nat West." <laughs> and she's like, "Well, I needed a calendar, didn't I?" But it's like it's 2023. Banks aren't. Is this like an American thing? Because I know you guys still do checkbooks, which blows my mind. Like the last time I saw a check was. Uh, 20 years ago, maybe? I don't know. It was a long time. I was a kid and I had a checkbook. Like, you know, when you get your first bank account, it's like a checkbook. And I had a, gar a check guarantee card, which would guarantee a check up to £50. And I was like, oh, 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 feeling fancy. If for some reason you care, where high, care when high tide is, you can either look it up on your phone or in the newspaper. But this sort of convenience didn't exist in the 1500s. Almanacs provided all sorts of useful information, particularly for farmers, related to moon cycles, the tides, weather predictions, planting dates, sunrise and sunset times, and other stuff that would have been nice to have in one place. While the weather predictions were obviously going to be very hit on this, most of the information was useful and reliable. But when almanacs were first created hundreds of years earlier, people didn't really understand how you could predict things like the tides without some sort of divination or magic. Is that, I don't know, how do you predict the tides? Because they follow a repeatable pattern! <laughs> like, what the f It's like, I think tonight will be a full- Is that because last night it was almost a full moon? Is that what you're thinking? <laughs> How do you do that? Magic. As soon as people already thought these almanacs were the results of occult divination, authors decided they might as well add horoscopes to their almanacs as well. Give the people what they want, right? Nostradamus' almanac was no different, with his earliest prophecies appearing in his 1550 work. Much to his delight, his first almanac was a critical and commercial success, so he decided to publish at least one almanac every year, sometimes more. His almanacs alone are known to contain 6,338 prophecies, though it's possible this isn't a complete list. These are not the prophecies for which he's most well known today, but Nostradamus made quite the name for himself in the day thanks to his almanacs. His work was exceptionally popular with the nobility, while the peasants weren't all big fans. The upper class found his prophecies to be fun and requested he do their own psychic readings, while the lower class thought he was the tool of the devil. The rationale usually given for this is that the poorer people were usually more superstitious, but this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Both sides were superstitious enough to believe the Nostradamus could see the future, it's just that half of them found it to be cute, and half of them thought it was evil. Prominent people, far away, relatively speaking, began writing to him, requesting horoscopes and advice, which he was more than happy to oblige. However, he requested that they provide their own birth charts that he could use for his astrological mumbo-jumbo. Typically, a professional astrologist would do this work themselves, and in the rare instances Nostradamus attempted to do it for someone, he would usually do it incorrectly, often forgetting to adjust for their time and location of birth. It's almost as if he didn't know what he was doing and was just in it for the money. <laughs> He's just making this up. In addition to his almanacs, Nostradamus wrote at least two medical books during this time. Sort of, anyway. He definitely had at least two medical books published, but we could definitely debate whether or not he actually wrote either of them. The first book was a very loose translation of a book written in the first century AD. His second book, Trade of Ardemont, contained recipes for medicine, cosmetics, preservatives, and a love potion. Sounds very medical, doesn't it? Was in his medical text. It's something about love potions and such. This book was almost entirely plagiarized as well, though he did include his recipe for rose pills as well as his other plague treatments. That recipe book was published in 1555, the same year as Nostradamus' most famous work, La Prophetise, or The Prophecies. This book delivers exactly what the title promises, as it contains a thousand prophecies broken up into ten centuries with a hundred prophecies each. Each prophecy was written as a quatrain, a four-line poem that is usually written with alternating lines of 
text rhyming. Of the quatrains contained within the prophecies, all but one rhymed. They did in French anyway, don't expect them to still rhyme when we start talking about the English translations of specific quatrains later. Also, don't let that central organizational system fool you. These prophecies were in no way written in chronological order. Oh, okay. I was like, if he did 100 prophecies for each century and specify the century when they were going to happen, I'd be more impressed. I mean, I still think it's still would think it's utter nonsense, but I'll be slightly more impressed than my level of impress now, which is zero. The book is mostly written in French, though it also includes Greek, Latin, and Occitan, a language spoken by the people in the region of Provence. Oh, is that why that? What's that fancy? Um, Os Occitanial or something? Occitan? Occitan? My wife loves it. Um, and it is very nice. Um, Occitanial or something? Is that why it's called that? It's from Provence. I know. It's fancy French soaps and shit. It's not ordered chronologically, and it is believed to contain anagrams and other secret codes to further obscure the meaning. It is believed that this was done by Nostradamus in an attempt to avoid running afoul of the Inquisition again. Even this is a matter of debate, as most likely neither prophecy nor astrology would have been considered heresy at the time. Either way, this book wasn't nearly as well received at first as his almanacs had been. It did well enough, but like his previous work, it mainly seemed to appeal to the upper class. I mean, isn't that fine? They're the ones with all the money. Although I suppose it's an almanac, how much can he charge for it? Although I feel like charge a little for the almanac, just charge like 50p for the almanac or whatever, and then be like, yeah, 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 it's good, right? You want me to come and read your future? Thousand pounds. Boom. Business. But that's fine because they're the ones with the money anyway. Yes, Kevin and I, same page. It's also important to note that because of how publications worked at the time, every printing of the prophecies is slightly different. Essentially, one person would read the original manuscript while another would typeset the printing press. When you're taking dictation like this, mistakes or inconsistencies are bound to pop up and that's what happens. But because people like to search for meaning or secret messages where none exist, just remember that any differences between printings was not some grand plan by Nostradamus to conceal information, it was just a pair of minimum wage employees who couldn't be fucked to double check their work. And due to some other issues with publishers, not all of Nostradamus's prophecies have survived to this day. The prophecies was published in installments, and it seems that he kind of just released whatever he had finished by that point. The second installment finished with the first 42 quatrains of his 7th century, but the new publisher for the third installment refused to start the book in the middle of a century. It's unclear if or how those remaining 58 quatrains from the 7th century were ever published, but no copies have survived to this day. While his almanacs were a big success, the prophecies received much more mixed reviews. There were still superstitious peasants that thought Nostradamus was an evil sorcerer, and there was still the nobility that found it all absolutely delightful. However, there was a growing population that believed he was a fraud peddling a load of bullshit. Really? He was, was he? Ironically, the vocal group calling him a fraud were professional astrologists. Ah! Oh God, the past. The most vocal was Lawrence Vidal, who in 1558 published a pamphlet entitled Declaration of the Abuses, Ignorances, and Seditions of Michel Nostradamus. In the book, Vidal accused Nostradamus of using a faulty method of predicting the future. Well, <laughs> He's like, well, he's in that way of predicting the future, you idiot. This is the only way to predict the future. He also noted that he wasn't even using the fake method properly. Vildell wrote, I can say with complete confidence that of true astrology, you understand less than nothing, as is evident not merely to the learned, but to learners in astrology too, as your works amply demonstrate, you who cannot calculate the least movement of any heavenly body whatsoever. <laughs> uh, the bull is calling out another bull. This is brilliant. That's pretty scathing, especially since Nostradamus claimed that his predictions were based on judicial astrology. Judicial astrology uses the locations of planets and stars to make predictions, though it isn't intended to predict specific events. When used properly, a term I use very loosely when discussing astrology, this method is designed to only determine the quality or potential of a specific day. Ah yes, all of this stuff sounds so real. For example, they may use the planetary alignment to determine May the 27th of that year was the best date to hold a coronation. They would reason that good things happened when the planets had been in a specific configuration before, so it would be the ideal day to try again. It was still only meant as a probability, though, and things could go horribly. Of course, I'm sure they'd argue it would have gone even worse if a different day had been chosen. Regardless, this all would rely on someone's ability to calculate where celestial bodies will be at a given point in the future, something that Nostradamus's contemporaries felt he was completely incapable of doing. And even if he had been able to do so, they took objection to his use of comparative horoscopy. This is similar to judicial astrology, except instead of determining how good a day will be, it assumes that you can make specific predictions based on the past. For example, if Caesar was assassinated when Mercury was in retrograde, is that really a thing? 
like Mercury being in retrograde. I thought that's the sarcastic thing when people talk about when they talk about astrology. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be a good day for me. Mercury's in retrogate. It's the sort of thing I'd say being sarcastic. But apparently it's a real thing. And Neptune was dawning in the age of Aquarius or whatever. Wait, is Kevin... It's like age of... Kevin's making this up, isn't he? Comparative horoscopy would say that the next time the celestial bodies were in the same configuration, that some important emperor or monarch would be assassinated again. I understand that history repeats, or at the very least rhymes, but I'm 100% confident it has nothing to do with the motion of celestial bodies and everything to do with humans being greedy and stupid. Unfortunately, by the time Bedell's pamphlet was published, it was entirely too late. That didn't happen until 1558, but in 1556, Nostradamus was summoned to Paris by Queen Catherine de' Medici. She wanted to ask him about one of the quatrains from his first century, as it appeared to be predicting the death of her husband, King Henry II. She also asked him to do horoscopes for her children. Money, 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 Nostradamus, he's done this pamphlet, and now he's gonna, like, go milk the Queen for all his money, yes! Nostradamus was understandably worried that this was all going to lead to his execution. Yes, but Nostro, high risk, high reward, baby, it's the queen! Catherine was actually just a big fan of his work. He was appointed to the role of counselor and physician in ordinary, meaning that he was a permanent physician working for the royal court. He was even able to maintain this position and remain the beneficiary of Catherine's generosity after his prediction came true and Henry II was killed in 1559. Uh-oh. I'll be like, did you kill him, Nostro? With his newfound position working directly for the royal family, he was now untouchable by both the Inquisition and the scathing words of Adele and other professional astrologists. They must be super pissed. It's like, how, how did Nostradamus die? He doesn't even know how to retrograde Mercury, and now he's the Queen's retrograder. But Nostradamus was running out of time by this point. He suffered from severe gout throughout his later life, the pain of which made movement difficult. The gout eventually developed into edema, and it's possible that this may have been the cause of his death. Other reports indicate that he likely died of congestive heart failure. We've already seen this episode, how terrible medical science was at the time, so there's really no way to get a definitive answer. But he just died. <laughs> I don't know, he's slightly old. <laughs> Just hurty chest. And so that ends the life of Nostradamus. He made a name for himself as a successful plague doctor, thanks to his combination of doing the obvious and accidentally creating vitamin C lozenges, and he went on to become even more famous as a prophet despite the objections that he knew less than nothing about the astrology that he claimed to be using. And this brings us to the main question of today's episode. Did Nostradamus successfully predict anything? He wrote a thousand quatrains for the prophecies and over six thousand more prophecies for his almanacs. Even a broken clock finds acorn once in a while. And with a sheer volume of predictions by simple statistics, he should have at least gotten something right, yes? Yeah, I mean, that's my theory. He's, like, gonna get something right. I mean, or is it just, it's just such nonsense. It's gonna be, like, super vague. You'll be like, yeah, I guess, okay. The Prophecies Nostradamus' prophecies deal heavily with doom and catastrophe. There's lots of talk about wars, natural disasters, a handful of antichrists, according to some interpretations, and the end of the world. But even if everything he wrote was correct, there's some good news. In the preface to the prophecies, Nostradamus said that his predictions extended from now, 1555, until 3797, so if anybody tries to tell you that he predicted the world will end in 2024 or something, you can rest assured. But no, he did not. In fact, Nostradamus very rarely included dates in his quatrains. It's often reported that he would enter a trance-like state and use water-gazing as a means to divine the future. This is almost certainly untrue for reasons we'll get into later. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, yeah, what are you going to do? I'm going to go look at the water and divide the future, whereas really he just goes to do a back room and he writes out whatever bullshit enters his mind to be like, yeah, at some point between now and the next like few millennia. <laughs> But whatever method he used to write his prophecies are, there are many who believe he predicted a startling number of events. His single most important prediction was the death of King Henry II. This was the prophecy that caught the eye of Catherine de' Medici, and the first that was believed to have come true. The quatrain read, The young lion will overcome the older one. On the battlefield, in single combat, he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Two wounds become one, and he dies a cruel death. Oh my god, it's so broad. It's so broad. On June the 30th, 1559, King Henry was celebrating the marriage of his daughter to King Philip II of Spain. The festivities included a jousting tournament, which Henry took part in. What was it? Pierce the eyes through a golden cage. Okay. During his joust against the younger Count of Montgomery, the Count's lance struck the King's helmet and shattered. A fragment of the splintered lance passed through the helmet and pierced through Henry's eye, passing into his brain. He died of sepsis 11 days later. Really? It's not like... 
<laughs> he didn't die from getting his brain pierced. He just died because they did have antibiotics. Holy sh- I, I mean, although you could still die from like something like that to that seems pretty intense. But also, you're jousting, my dude. Like, what do you expect? What's going on? Like, why would you do that? To readers of the prophecies, this seemed extremely straightforward. Henry and the Counts both had lions adorning their shields, and Henry was the older of the two. They engaged in a joust, and Henry was pierced through the eye. He was also pierced through the brain, which I don't think they were aware of at the time, but whether they knew of the second wound or not, it was definitely a cruel death. With those events transpiring just four years after the prophecies was published, it certainly gave a lot of credibility to Nostradamus' work for people that want to believe in him. But now things will get a little bit more abstract. More abstract is already abstract. It's like, okay, so they had lions on their shields. Um, A young lion will overcome an older one. It's just like... In battlefields, on the battlefield, they're not on a battlefield, they're jousting, it's a game. He will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. There was no golden cage, he was just wearing a helmet. Two wounds become one. Well, he didn't get two wounds. That's like saying, oh yeah, I got shot and he went through my skin and into my lung. And it's like, I got two wounds, skin and lung, maybe a bone as well, three wounds. You know, it's just, it's just, you're you're trying to shove something to make it fit. And it fits perfectly. A little tight in the crotch, to be honest. Uh, okay, so here's another one. Paul Ney Laurent will be more of fire than blood to swim in praise, the great one to flee to the confluence. He will refuse entry to the piouses, the depraved ones, and the durance will keep them imprisoned. The reason that was hard to read is because it was its just like, what the f***? <laughs> Paul Ney and Lauren are towns in France, but together they form an anagram for Napoleon Roy, which I guess is supposed to be King Napoleon spelt wrong. Oh, please. Or perhaps I just don't understand how Nostradamus constructed his anagrams, as he seems to have a specific method for doing it just so that I can't figure it out. That makes much more sense than this just being a case of man searches for something and he finds what he's looking for. Anyway, this is one of multiple quatrains believed to be about Napoleon. Uh, this is ridiculous. Oh yeah, it's an anagram. These three towns, if you match them together, they sort of spell Napoleon. That's like you're doing a crossword. You're like, there's my words! But it's not in a straight line. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you get the second letter in, in the line below. No! No! The reference to being more fire than of the blood is because Napoleon rose to power out of the French Revolution rather than having been of royal lineage. The second half is believed to be references to Popes Pius the Sixth and Pius the Seventh. <laughs> Trying to read Roman numerals on the fly there, it's like, oh, yes, a five plus one, B.I. Oh, we're imprisoned by Napoleon. Next, let's look at a much more literal quatrain. The lost thing is discovered, hidden for many centuries. Pasteur will be celebrated almost as a godly like figure. This is when the moon completes her great cycle, but by other rumors, he shall be dishonored. Okay, so I assume we're talking about Louis Pasteur, who... Antibiotics, right? (laughs) Pasteurization. Fleming was antibiotics. Louis Pasteur, pasteurization. Um, So celebrating as a godlike figure. So this could... Anyone who was called Pasteur and did something slightly impressive, not that realizing pasteurization wasn't, that was very impressive. Um, it was hidden for centuries, sure, but that's the case with any discovery. Like, oh, there's a coffee on my desk right now, so I'm thinking of coffee. It's like someone, it wasn't the story about the goats eating the coffee beans, and it's like, coffee was hidden for centuries. Yeah, of course it was, because that's how everything is until it's discovered. Um, this is when the moon completes a great cycle. I don't understand what that could possibly be about. But by other, by other rumors, he shall be dishonored. Okay, so that's basically saying like Louis Pasteur did something which was a bit spicy or something. Could be anything. People could say that about me. It's like Simon said once said he wanted a dog genocide. It's like, I didn't for one. <laughs> I don't know why I keep bringing this up. I have to keep defending myself about why one time I said that I'd prefer a dog genocide over a human genocide. And people were like, dogs are so pure. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, but people are f- people, aren't they? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just not sure about that right now. Anyway, let's move on from that and see how people try and find meaning, which is not there. Okay. This one seems a bit more precise since it gives a name and a time frame. Starting with the third line, the Moon Great Cycle refers to some sort of cycle that began in 1536 and ended in 1889. Whether this is some real astronomical thing they're talking about or some astrological malarkey, I couldn't tell you, but for the sake of argument, I'll take it at face value that this is a real cycle that exists. 
Pasteur is, of course, Louis Pasteur, who was indeed famous by the end of that cycle. Was he celebrated as a godlike figure? That probably is a matter of opinion, but he was certainly celebrated. He patented the process of pasteurization to save everybody's wine from spoiling and then applied it to beer and milk as well. For those who don't know, pasteurization is basically just boiling shit to kill any bacteria in it. Uh, yeah, but then being in a, uh, while in a sealed environment, right? So no new bacteria you can get in. Because we knew that if we, we did know that if we boiled stuff before, it would kill all the bugs in it, right? We just didn't realize that we could keep the bugs out if it was in a sealed con- I don't know. Look, I feel like, anyway, let's just move on. Before I seem even more ignorant than I am. This is indeed something that a previous limb done, but it never really caught on because they had no idea the bacteria existed or why it might even help. He also created the first rabies vaccine that was tested at 85. I did not know that! which is basically the end of that moon cycle. The ability to save the life of someone who has been attacked by a rabid dog certainly made Pasteur a hero, and it saved him from prosecution for having treated the boy's rabies despite not actually being a licensed physician. I know the story of this. I had just completely forgotten that it was the same Louis Pasteur who devised this, which is crazy. And as I often say, rabies is crazy. Like, you get bitten by a rabid dog, you get one symptom of that, rabies, you're dead. You have to get vaccinated before. Like, you get bitten by that dog, you've got to go to the hospital right away to get that rabies vaccine. Like, immediately. Otherwise, you just die. You will die. As the rumors, those came much later. In 1995, a book was published that portrayed Pasteur as a liar and a thief stealing the work of others. This was largely reviewed as revisionist history, but it could technically count as dishonoring Pasteur. Yeah, okay, we're really looking for stuff here, aren't we? Moving on! The blood of the just will commit a fault at London, burnt through lightning of 23's the 6. The ancient lady will fall from her high place. Several of the same sect will be killed. Oh, please. What, where, what are we going to read into this generic mumbo-jumbo? And do bear in mind, these are just the well-known one. ones. There were like 6,000-something of these, weren't there? So here's a great example of what makes examining Nostradamus's work so vexing. Reading this, it doesn't seem like a clear prediction of any historical event, and yet it's widely regarded as prophesizing the Great Fire of London. How, you ask? Well, 23's is 60, and 6 more is 66. So what if we're just to translate these first two lines differently? An alternative, much more generous translation reads, The blood of the just will be lacking in London, burnt up in the fire of 66. The Great Fire of London took place in 1666, so suddenly this seems a lot more obvious. But as for this new translation, the first line then seems to indicate that the just will no longer be dying in London because the fire killed off all the rats whose fleas had been spreading the plague. Once the fire was finally extinguished, so too was London's fear of the plague. The part mentioning several of the same sect being killed could refer to the eight or so deaths that were believed to be caused by the fire, though the part about the ancient lady is still anybody's guess. There's a lot of stuff like this, and I mean a lot. But let's fast forward to some more modern examples. Among Nostradamus's most famous predictions is the rise of Adolf Hitler. He wrote, From the depths of west of Europe, a young child will be born of poor people. He who, by his tongue, will seduce a great troop. His fame will increase towards the realm of the east. Okay, well, first of all, Austria, Western Europe. I mean, if you want to divide West and Eastern Europe by the uh, the Iron Curtain, yes, but that's a very modern post-Hitler definition, and Austria is definitely in Central Europe geographically, so no. A young child will be born of poor people. Well, a young child, yes, is born of poor people. No, Hitler's parents were quite... Hitler's parents, his, his, uh, his father was... Uh, he worked in the customs office or something like that and made quite decent money. Hitler was poor later, but he wasn't born poor. He was born with money. He didn't work for ages. He was like a layabout, like man of leisure. He who by his tongue will seduce a great troop. Sure, uh, that's true. His fame will increase towards the realm of the East. Uh, well, his fame increased everywhere because he was famous or infamous. Um, so the, the it's, it's just like, yeah, of course it's accurate for Hitler, but it could be accurate for like any person, any leader from Western Europe or Europe at all, because we just suddenly said Austria is in Western Europe. That sounds like a pretty accurate description of Hitler, and really, how could Nostradamus have possibly known that at some point between 1555 and 3797, somebody in Europe would be born poor and then ascend to power because of his abilities as a public speaker? That is some really compelling stuff. Yeah, not to mention the part about it not being Western Europe, him not being poor, <laughs> and, it just be, and it not just being the East. Sorry, I shouldn't be so snarky. I'm not supposed to be trying to debunk these prophecies until the next section, but I mean, what the f***? Come on now. That is the most broadly generic prediction you could possibly make. Does it accurately describe Hitler? By... Sure. 
<laughs> sort of, Kevin. Not so much. By 3797, are there going to be lots of other people it describes? Yes. But the reason that people latch onto this passage specifically with regards to Hitler is because of all the times that Notre Dame mentions Hitler by name in his prophecies. For example, the reign of the eagle will be much longer upon those seated in the realm of the east. Hitler, who with Austria makes an understanding, he will cause them to reign over the Aquilanes. Hitler was, uh, I mean, okay. There's definitely more to that one because he specifically mentioned him by name, but I get the feeling we're gonna... I, I mean, let's see where this goes. I have no idea who the Aquilanes are, but this one certainly sounds more compelling. When Hitler is literally name-dropped, it's hard to argue with that. There's a chance that Simon remembers how this passage is going to turn out thanks to a biographics video from three years ago. But if so, try not to spoil it yet. No chance, Kevin. I don't remember that at all. We can let the people who believe in psychics hold on to hope for a little longer before pulling back the curtain. But if Nostradamus was going to predict the rise of Hitler, surely he had to have predicted World War II as well, right? Well, don't worry, we've got that covered. Beasts ferocious with hunger will cross the rivers. The greater part of the battlefield will be against Hitler. Into a cage of iron will the Great One be drawn when the child of Germany observes nothing. Um, one, he's a child of Austria. He was born in Graz. Where was Hitler born? No, I was like Immanuel something or like, ah, oh, where the f*** was Hitler born? Why don't I know that? This is one of multiple passages that are regarded as predictions for the Second World War, but it's among the most blatant. There's also another one that mentions de Gaulle by name, but this one is particularly interesting because Germany wouldn't even exist until 300 years after Nostradamus died. At the time, the area was the Holy Roman Empire of the Germanic nations, so, so he had to predict not only the rise of Hitler, but that the people referred to as German would form their own nation and would choose to, in fact, call it Germany. Um, they didn't, though. They call it Deutschland. The rest of the world calls it Germany because of Germanic language roots. Something like that? Is that right? I don't remember. But they don't call it Germany. We call it Germany. They call it Deutschland. <laughs> if Nostradamus knew this much about World War II, you best believe he was able to predict the stunning conclusion. Near the gates and within two cities, there will be scourges, the like of which was never seen. Famine within plague, people put out by steel, crying to the great immortal God for relief. The two cities are, of course, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Of course, of course they are. With the atomic bombings being the scourges, the like of which were never seen, put out by steel could be a reference to the planes that dropped the bombs, uh, please, uh, with the remainder referring to both nuclear fallout and radiation sickness. Even if we're giving these prophecies the benefit of the doubt, that one does feel like a bit of a stretch. Maybe this one will be more clear. The ancient task will be completed. From on high, evil will fall on the great man. A dead innocent will be accused of the deed. The guilty one must remain in the mist. What? I, I have no idea. I have no idea. The ancient task will be complete. Some sort of assassination? A dead innocent will be accused of the deed? Oh, who the f*** knows. It should go without saying that this quatrain is, of course, a reference to John F. Of course it is! JFK being assassinated by shots fired from above and the subsequent conspiracy to pin the blame on Lee Harvey Oswald. Oswald was unable to defend himself on being accounted murdered while he was in custody, and the truth behind the assassination has remained a mystery. The only unclear part is why this would be considered an ancient task. I don't remember any biblical scenes where God said to Moses, F*** the Kennedys. That seems to be a much newer sentiment, mostly localized to the area where we had the same Kennedy as senator for 50 years. The final prophecy we're going to look at is another one, which should be mostly obvious to which it refers. The sky will burn at 45 degrees latitude. Fire approaches the great new city. Immediately, a huge scattered flame leaps up when they want to have verification from the Norman. I feel like I know this one referring to like 9-11 or something, but reading it now, I have no idea how. I have no idea how that could possibly be interpreted like this. 45 degrees latitude passes through New York. Okay, so naturally, the great new city is New York City. The flames leaping up are obviously references to 9-11 and the attack on the Twin Towers. Uh, okay. The reference to the Norman is a little less clear, as this could be somebody from Normandy, the region of northern France, or it could be a reference to someone descended from the Scandinavian Vikings. I don't believe Osama bin Laden ever signed up for 23andMe, so perhaps he was either part French or part Scandinavian, and we just don't know about it. Does seem unlikely. While there are a lot of other examples, there are some of these are some of Nostradamus' most famous predictions. Even the famous ones are sh some are more contested than others, and true believers don't agree on everything because of the subjective nature of a lot of these quatrains. I'm guessing that Simon is thoroughly unimpressed by the prognostic abilities of Nostradamus thus far. You're goddamn right, Kevin. But for any of you watching that are, it is now time to thoroughly debunk all of this. 
fake it till you make it. If I recall, I said that the prophecies was not nearly as popular during Nostradamus's time as his almanacs were. It has since become his most famous work, but the delay in recognition is in no small part the result of the various translations that have been produced. Because of the nature of the printing process at the time, early versions of the prophecies were slightly different. It doesn't help that, as time goes on, fewer and fewer people properly understand Middle French, and this has all led to a breadth of wildly different translations of Nostradamus's work. Yeah, the Hitler thing must have been a mistranslation, right? I don't remember that from the biographics episode I made about him, but it's that just feels right. These translations have been adjusted and adapted over time, and English translations have become increasingly liberal in how they are interpreted. This is generally done after an important event has taken place, and people have decided they want to attribute to one of, it to one of Nostradamus's quatrains. For example, when they're talking about World War II, I mentioned that Nostradamus makes explicit reference to Hitler multiple times. That's actually a lie, and he never once wrote Hitler's name. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> what he actually wrote was Hister, which sounds a lot like Hitler. It's close enough that many translations, like the one used earlier, simply replaced Hister with Hitler on the assumption that Nostradamus just spelled the name wrong. Oh my god, it's ridiculous. This is ridiculous. However, at the time he was still alive, Hister was just a name for the lower Danube region, and that is always certainly what Nostradamus was referring to. The line mentioning Hitler in Austria is actually Hister and Oster. Given the context of Middle French, the supposed portent of the Austrian Hitler's rise to power is actually stating that the lower Danube region and its host will get along and laugh. But, well, that's not nearly as exciting, is it? In fact, Nostradamus never actually referenced anybody by name in his prophecies. Doing something like that would be far too specific and make it easier to disprove his psychic abilities, which is why he also makes no reference to specific years. The earlier reference to Louis Pasteur is a deliberate misinterpretation of the writing. While he did write Pasteur in the aforementioned quatrain, it was not a name. It's just the French word for pasteur. <laughs> Because of course it is. Even when we give them the generous interpretation and the mistranslations, they're still rubbish. And when you look at the original ones, it's how is this a thing? How is this a thing? The supposed reference to the Great Fire of London is also fairly ridiculous. The original text states that the fire was started by lightning, but the Great Fire was caused by an accidental fire in a bakery. The more generous translation I included both removed that inconvenient comment about lightning and interpreted the numbers as equating 66, and thus meaning 1666. There's no reason to make either of these changes to the text, other than to make it more closely fit what had already happened. Then there's the supposed 9-11 prediction. There's a more popular one circulating that specifically references steel birds crashing down on the metropolis, but that is entirely fictional, so I didn't include it. It was created as a hoax to prove a point, and was cited as being from Nostradamus in 1644, nearly a hundred years after his death. I like whoever came up with that hoax. I like it. Because it's just like a slam dunk. You can imagine just having a conversation with someone, like, there's a member of my family who believes in all this nonsense. Or like, not nonsense. They don't really believe in this. They just believe in conspiracy theories. But I could imagine them saying like, oh yeah, well, Nostradamus said about the steel birds. And I'd be like, well, actually, someone on the internet made that up. And they even wrote the wrong date on the quote on purpose so that they could come back later and be like, no, I made it up. He was dead. And you know that person would just be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I think that's wrong. And you'll be like, okay. Because <laughs> that's the end of the conversation, isn't it? It's like, you can think that. And I'm not going to change your mind, have I? Because you're insane. <laughs> Unfortunately, people couldn't be been, and be bothered to read the entire story and quickly circulated the alleged prophecy as a fact. The passage I did include is equally useless. Looking at the original French, it doesn't seem to mention 45 degrees latitude at all. There's nothing there that I could even fathom how it'd be mistranslated as such. But even if it had, it is only technically true that 45 degrees passes through New York. It goes through the very northernmost tip, nowhere near New York City. It would be more likely to assume that the city in question would be Milan, Belgrade, or Belfast, rather than anything in North America. Oh my god, that is a broad... <laughs> Like, oh yeah, it could be New York City, or Belfast, or Belgrade. That's pretty far east, like, compared to New York. In fact, a lot of the supposed prophecies seem to do with America. The JFK assassination and 9-11 are both American events, and the atomic bombings were a combination of America and Japan. On the other hand, this makes a lot of sense. The United States is the greatest and most important country in the world. <laughs> I mean, I know Kevin's, like, maybe writing that with a little bit of sarcasm, but, like, as an impartial observer, like, like it or not... Currently, the United States is the greatest and most important country in the world, I think. Maybe China's coming for you, America, but right now, it's true. The greatest economic power, certainly. Political power. Cultural power. I, I think so. 
English is the most common spoken language around the world and is the source of many of these translations. And of course, English was invented in the United States, whereas steady on where it was then made our national language. We also invented democracy, the photograph and the taco. With this great land being the center of the world, obviously lots of important events would be worthy of foretelling that would take place in America. The only problem with all of that, other than blatant sarcasm dripping off all of those factual inaccuracies, is that Nostradamus explicitly said his predictions weren't about us. He wrote a letter to Henry II that included a foreword in the prophecies and stated that these predictions corresponded to towns and cities of all Europe, including Africa and part of Asia, where most of all these coming events are to transpire. <laughs> Not America! There are a couple of different ways to read the read the phrase most of all and seeing as i'm not an expert on middle french i'll let you take your pick it's possible that he was saying that the vast majority of his prophecies were going to take place in europe africa and part of asia in which case we could maybe let the vast quantity of american predictions slide it's worth noting as well that nostradamus is unlikely to have known japan existed so it would not be a part of asia to which he referred and would likely be another outlier Another way to read this phrase is that most of all means of most importance, and is possibly a somewhat awkward-sounding sentence due to the translation. While this would be a smoking gun that nothing involving US events could ever have been predicted by Nostradamus, sadly, I think this reading is less likely. He used the phrase most of to describe his quatrains at least half a dozen times in this letter, so it seems like a clear sign that he was trying to hedge his bets and leave everything open to in as much interpretation as possible. Of course he was. Although speaking of Henry II's, you may still be one about that quatrain that predicted his death it was by far the most accurate sounding of any of these the lions the battle the two wounds the slow painful death of course a lot of this is just surely coincidence lions were the most common animal to appear in medieval coats of arms and it's not really close injuries to the eye were likely relatively common in battle as full plate mail would have protected a person's body with the slits in the helmet's visor being the only somewhat exposed area henry ii also didn't die in the field of battle he died in a playful joust being performed to celebrate his daughter's wedding and a newfound peace, which is sort of the opposite of battle. But most notably, there is again the letter written by Nostradamus to Henry. The quatrain predicting Henry's death was part of the first publication in 1555, but this letter was written in 1558. The letter was addressed to the most invincible, most powerful, and most Christian Henry, King of France II. There's no evidence that Henry was ever referred to by the title Invincible outside of this letter, which just means it was Nostradamus' own personal appraisal of the man. Obviously, I'm not suggesting that he actually thought Henry was immortal, but he was only 39 years old at the time and should have had a long life ahead of him. Why on earth would Nostradamus refer to someone as invincible if he already knew that the person would be dead within the year? Okay, so maybe these prophecies aren't quite what they've cracked up to be. They're heavily open to interpretation, and the well has been poisoned by mistranslations, both deliberate and accidental. Even without being mistranslated, I have to emphasize how ridiculous the quatrain that allegedly predicted the rise of Hitler was. All Nostradamus said was that somewhere in Europe in the next 2,000 years, a poor person will rise to power. And Hitler wasn't even poor! <laughs> That's pretty much it. That is so absurdly vague that, of course, eventually something is going to happen. But wait a minute. I did mention a few more specific predictions. While they are exceedingly rare, I believe, occurring less than a dozen times in the total of a thousand prophecies, Nostradamus did occasionally include a date. Let's have a look at one of those. The year 1999. Seventh month, July of 1999, okay. From the sky will come a great king of terror, shall be revived the king of Angulmoy, before and after Mars to reign as chance will have it. Okay. Look, I'm pretty sure don't remember much about July 1999. I was but 12 years old. Like, what? N n nothing. I don't remember some king of terror coming down from the sky. <laughs> feel like that would be notable. Weird, but I don't seem to remember any terrifying world leaders coming back from the dead in 1999. <laughs> in fact, just suddenly, Stalin just rises from the grave, or maybe it's Hister. In fact, nobody has been able to figure out what the hell happened in 1999 that this could have possibly been referring to. And it's not for lack of trying, and this quatrain has been retranslated and reinterpreted everywhere imaginable, but any possible meaning continues to elude us. Fine, so maybe Nostradamus wasn't really a psychic, but neither is anybody else. At least he meant well and was trying his best. It's not like he could possibly have been in this for the money, right? What about all those long nights he spent water gazing and placing himself into a mystical trance? As it turns out, that almost certainly never happens. If you recall the two medical books that I mentioned Nostradamus publishing, one was just a paraphrasing of an ancient text, and the other was almost entirely plagiarized. 
Is there any reason to think that the prophecies would be any different? How could he possibly have written this book while in a meditative trance if he needed to pay attention to the copy of Mirabilis Liber that he was copying word for word? No, he didn't! Mirabilis Liber, 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 Liber was a massive compilation of predictions made by various Christian saints over the course of nearly a thousand years. It was very popular when it was first published in 1522, but it quickly fell out of favor. Not because people didn't find it interesting, but because it was mostly written in Latin and lots of confusing abbreviations that made it difficult to read. Nostradamus plagiarized his prophecies from the Mirabilis Liber, the Twelve Caesars, Livre de l'Essat et Mutations de blah blah blah, something in French, uh, which had been published by Richard Rissart only six years earlier and countless other sources. If ChatGPT had existed in the 1500s, I've no doubt that it would have published a thousand prophecies per week. Yeah, and then people would look back at it on so, as some sort of god. Basically, all Nostradamus did was copy a bunch of other people's doomsday prophecies and sprinkle in vague references references to historical events using comparative horos hor horoscopy. Is that a real word? <laughs> and since experts of the day felt he was incapable of accurately calculating the motion of celestial bodies, he probably did the last part wrong anyway. To be fair to Nostradamus, even though I don't think that's necessary at this point, <laughs> it's, yeah, fuck Nostradamus. <laughs> This blatant plagiarism would have been wouldn't have been scandalous at the time. The idea of plagiarism didn't really exist, and it was common for authors to copy or paraphrase the works of others without giving them credit, especially when it came to classical works. Ah, oh, what a better time. <laughs> This was the present day. I'd be like, yeah, fuck hiring writers. I'm just going to find a video on YouTube and just read it in my own voice. Boom! Money printing. But on the other hand, Nostradamus was also probably deliberately being a dick. Richard Rissart had proposed 2242 as a possible date for the end of the world. While copying Rissart's work, Nostradamus would have realized that he needed to make a different prediction for the eventual apocalypse if he expected his book to sell. So he just added 2242 to the current year of 1555. And that's why Nostradamus's predictions ran through 3797. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Nostradamus. How do people still remember to you today, you con artist? Wrap up. Nostradamus was a highly successful plague doctor, and that's really what he should be remembered as. Despite the complete misunderstanding of disease and medicine that existed at the time, he was able to come up with actionable plans that genuinely saved lives. Even his rose pills almost certainly helped decrease the mortality rate of his patients, even if he was completely wrong about why they were helping. And before any pedants get me in the comments and mention that his rose pills contained sweet calamus, which is banned in the US for being toxic, I promise it was fine. It's true that the ingredient is banned, but it's toxic in high doses after long periods of time, which is not how patients were taking it. Yes, it is also a carcinogen, but if the options are die from the plague tomorrow or maybe get cancer in 20 years, there's a pretty easy choice. The vitamin C lozenges may not have been as effective as antibiotics would have been, but they still provided a very real benefit, and I think he deserves credit for that. Yes, agreed, the whole plague doctor thing was legit. Beyond that, like, I'll just be like the drinking clean water thing. That is way like, great. But what Nostradamus does not deserve credit for is predicting anything. Literally anything. All of the prophecies are so extremely vague that they could be interpreted to fit whatever the reader wants them to. It's also important to note that the prophecies has never been used to accurately predict a future event. His quatrains have only ever been perceived as making accurate predictions of an event after that event has already happened. <laughs> Which is so useful! <laughs> and can then be applied retroactively. There has never been a reading of his work that produced a meaningful and specific prediction that came to pass. Even if that had helped, it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Nostradamus still wouldn't have successfully predicted anything. He would have just plagiarized the work of somebody else. But hey, would you rather be able to say you died with integrity, or would you rather be able to leave $2 million behind for your family? I have to say, I think I'd rather die with... Oh, I don't know! No! F integrity! If I'm dead, who gives a f My family are going to need some money. Because... I'm the breadwinner, baby. Let's Nostradamus this sh Thanks for being here. That's where we end today's show. Leave a review on Spotify or a rating. If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. That I can predict for sure.